We're going to look at seven things that God has taught us over the last five years. As you guys know, we've gone through all these sermon series. You'll see them on the screen. And through all of them, God has taught us different truths. And I see it as very intentional by the Lord God Almighty that he took us through each one of these series. It was not me. It was not my ideas. It was God teaching us something very specific about who he is. We went through series like through the book of James and looked at living the practicality of our faith. We went through a series on the spiritual journey, what it, what it looks like for someone growing their faith day by day, week by month, year by year. We looked at a series about God questions that people have. We went to congregations to make your hardest questions about who God is, what the Bible is, Let's talk about it. Let's, let's unpack these things. We looked at the parables of Jesus. We went through a series and read every parable of Jesus and tried to understand how it fits into a bigger picture of how God's kingdom works. We went through the, the book of Revelation, names of Jesus, the names of God from the Old Testament, the book of Mark, the life of David, shapes of faith, experiencing the depths of Jesus, and then our last one, which we concluded this morning, transitions. And how hard change can be. God said so much to us through all this. And the purpose in all of this is week by week, Sunday by Sunday, to begin to put puzzle pieces together about who God is from his word. And more and more, we have a full picture then, as those pieces slide into place, ah, that is who the creator of the universe is. And that's what he says about himself. God has every person in this room. If you are in this room, you can check your pulse. If you have a pulse, do you feel it? I've got one. That's good. If you have a pulse, God has you on a spiritual journey. The question is, what phase are you on that spiritual journey? Where are you at? Are you still wondering who God is? Are you growing in your faith? Are you like a, a, a warrior for Christ who's out there spreading the good news of everyone? Maybe you slip back and you're struggling. But we're all at a certain point in our journey. And I just I consider all the people I see in the room, and I know all of you are at a different phase of your adventure. And God is saying something to you that's unique to all of us in this room. Amen? Amen. So let's go back to the beginning. In 2019, this guy, Justin, is a new pastor in the Salvation Army. Fresh out of training college, fresh out of seminary, and I will tell you guys, I was terrified. <laughs> terrified. I remember coming here and being so afraid. I had never in my life experienced the kind of fear I had when I first came here. I didn't know anyone, not a single person in the city that I know. I didn't know my staff. I didn't know. I, I felt like I didn't know how to how to do my job. I felt like I I just had no idea what was going to happen. But God gave me courage for the battle ahead. That's the first thing that God taught us in this church was courage. Courage, friends, is when you are afraid and you do it anyway. That's what courage is. I think, I think we often think of courage as like someone who is larger than life and has no fear. No. Courage is being afraid, but then doing it anyway, because you know it's the right thing to do. Amen? And here's what Jeremiah was told. He said, get yourself ready. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. I know, isn't that intense? God's like, I command you to be courageous. It's not a suggestion. I'm not, I'm not giving you a suggestion. You will be courageous. Or I am, in fact, going to fill you with terror if you decide you're going to be terrified. I'll expand that terror then. You're going to be afraid. But if you're courageous, I will bless your courage. Interesting, isn't it? If I could give advice to any pastor or officer stepping into a new role, it would be this. Don't give up those first few months. Because I was so scared those first few months, but I didn't give up. You push through that initial phase and you'll be all right. It gets better, you'll feel faith and courage begin to replace doubt and fear. 
I remember you guys starting Dinner Church back in 2019. There's some pictures for some of our first services. And suddenly we went from just a handful of people, four or five, and pretty soon we had 30 people coming regularly. I was amazed. I was shocked. And we really hadn't done that much. I mean, me and Scott and a few others, we spread the word, talked to people during the week, handed out flyers around town, posted on social media. But in the end, God brought together a family here at the Salvation Army. And I just... I, I, I would sit down at dinner church, and I'm like, God gave me this family, and it's so cool. Look what he's doing. And I was just a few months in, and I just felt honored by God that he brought these people around me to hear the word of God. I thought, wow, God trusts me to bring his word. And that matters. And friends, he trusts you, too, to send out his word. Yeah, you're a flawed human. Yeah, you make mistakes. But fundamentally, God trusts you to send his word out into this community. And I believe in you, too. I know you guys are going to do that. If you don't give up, you find your courage. God builds it as you refuse to stop, as you cling to his promises, as you keep showing up, the courage forms. I saw it in our people learning Learning. I mean, I begin to see people like, like Karen sharing her faith boldly. I begin to see people like Scott sharing their faith boldly. I begin to, to see people in this room who, who are otherwise nervous and stressed and fearful become mighty with the Holy Spirit within them. And it was, that is what our God does. He takes the, 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 the most weak and makes us heroes. He makes us heroes. Second, second thing. This is a hard concept that we're going to look at. God taught us the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. There was this gift that I found as I studied God's word, as I got to know God better. And yet I found in myself, you guys, compromise. I found in myself, you guys, double-mindedness. I found in myself, you guys, uh, lust and pride and things that I didn't want there, and yet nothing seemed to change. I used to treat the commands of God as optional. Ooh. Oh, that's, uh, oh, forgive your enemies? Well, that's optional. Yeah, maybe I'll do that if I feel like it. Love, love your neighbor? Yeah, maybe if I feel like it, I'll do that. If I feel it? Maybe I'll do it. That's not how it works. God's commands are not optional. They are required. And as I learned that, and as I studied about the prophets and God's judgments and hell and near-death experiences and testimonies of, of, of uh, the anger of God, I began to experience something called the fear of the Lord. And... As a result, as I began to tremble before God and his word, lust disappeared from my life. Pride disappeared from my life. Humility took over. And I began to be much more prone to hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God. And here's something my wife told me. When we were, when we were just about to start dating, do you know what made her say yes? She saw something in me that was not in many other Christian men who had proposed to her, right, let's date, let's get together. She saw the fear of the Lord in me, that it wasn't just a game to me. It wasn't just a fun thing that I would do on weekends. It wasn't just, oh, yeah, I love God, and that, and that, and that. But I really did fear God. I really wanted to do his will. And... She saw, when I looked in her eyes, that I looked at her with purity, and not like someone who was hooked on porn. Guess what, guys? Women can see that in your eyes. I'm just being real. But if you look at a woman with purity, that's an entirely different story. And that is what got me a yes from the woman in my dream. I need to do what God wants me to do. 
It's not just some option near the bottom of the list. It's the only thing. Can you hear me today? Doing God's will is at the top of my list. And friends, I want it to be at the top of your list, not at the bottom. Not at the bottom. What if you embrace that? What if you begin to tremble a bit at God and what he can do? Tremble at his commands. Might it, might it prompt you to, to want to obey him more thoroughly? You know, what, you know what the fear of the Lord gave me? He gave me the power to say no to evil things. To say no to lust, to say no to pride, to say no to gossip, to say no to things that I knew were wrong. Thank God. Because I was so sick of being double-minded of having one foot in and one foot out. God has taught me this. And I am so grateful. Our church members, as well, begin to take God's commands seriously. A lot of the people in this picture begin to live different lives, repent of their sins. Gossip died down. Addictions faded away. God, been de God began delivering us from the sins of the flesh. And it has been powerful. Thirdly, humility. First Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Friends, God taught us humility here at the Salvation Army. I remember when I first got here and the word was going around town, there's this new dynamic pastor at the Salvation Army who's excited about the mission. Guess what? It went right to my head. went right to my head. I began to think about what, what, a, what a great guy I was, what, what I could do. And guess what? That led to pride. That led to pride. And God taught us humility. He taught me humility. He saved me from selfish ambition. Guess what? A lot of pastors and ministers struggle with something called selfish ambition. I'm going to show the world how great I am. No more. No more. No more. Mm -mm. I'm sick of that crap. I'm sick of trying to show people how good I am. I'm going to show them how great my God is. And then that is what's going to change the world. Not how cool I am. Not how fancy I am. No more. Humility. Who's it about? It's about God. It's about him and his word. And I, I would say of this list, this is the greatest thing God taught me was by humbling me. Do you, do you know how he did it? I was sick for about two years. So sick. And Chelsea, if you don't mind me sharing, my wife also battled this. And she also became deathly sick. God humbled her through suffering. That's, not, that's a gift he gives us. When we get prideful, the Bible says he will humble us. And thank God, because who Chelsea is today is someone who is led by the Spirit. And who I am today is someone who has been humbled by the powerful hand of God. I was sick with stomach, severe stomach problems for two years. Two years. You can see it in this picture. I am, I am not looking so good in this picture. I am struggling in that picture. I was in sickness in this time of my life. But it got me humble. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, when you get sick, so sick, you can barely stand for weeks, for months. You can't work in the flesh anymore. You just you can't because you can't move, right, Chelsea? You can't move. Then how can you how can you workaholic it? You can't. You, it's over. It's over. And the spirit is the only one who can. Then. When I am weak, He is strong. Amen? Amen. I used to drag God behind my efforts. God, keep up with me. I'm gonna. I'm the hero. You keep up with me. You be my. You be my press agent, Lord, right? Oh, no more. No more. Now it's different. And I see the body of believers embrace humility, serving each other, treating the homeless with dignity and respect, returning love after insult or slander. That's beautiful humility. I've seen people in this church, in this community, where someone just, just, rips them, mocks them, and they return love and forgiveness. 
That is what Christ did. Fourthly, holiness. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So this is all progressions. Each one builds on the next, right? And eventually, all this led to being truly set apart for service to God. And I saw that go on with our church members and the people in this community. They began to be set apart. They began to become mature believers who were really set apart for special use by the Lord. I've seen that happen with so many people who attend the church. So many people. Randy, Shannon, Danny, Brett, Amber, Destiny, myself, Chelsea. We honestly confess our sins, and God does something then. When we acknowledge what's going wrong in our lives, when we really say, Lord, I messed up. Lord, I've done bit. I, I did something terrible. Instead of hiding it, we confess it. And that brings a transformation, you guys. God does something when we're willing to confess it and admit it. Fifthly, out of all this came real love. I know that's, that sounds pretty basic, but I'm not talking about, oh yeah, I love you. No, I mean, I really, I, I, I love this person, and I want them, I want everything good for them in their lives. And I've seen that in, in all of you. We've learned to love each other. It says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine. This comes very naturally to my wife back there. She honestly and genuinely loves people very, very deeply. And everyone, everyone in this room knows that. They feel loved by Chelsea. And God has been teaching what I see in my wife. To, to happen in me slowly as well. That I can learn to love people with that tenderness and that attention to detail that is so rare. I think maybe guys struggle with that a little more. Loving in, in details and the small things and in those little moments when it matters, right? So much. That's rare. I challenge you today, love people genuinely. That is a feeling, right? It is a feeling but it is matched by actions. Amen? Actions, practical actions, are what real love looks like. So I've seen, I've seen love happen here, particularly in Vacation Bible School. Um, just seeing all the volunteers who helped with VBS, um, there was so much love uh, for, for those wonderful children who were running around screaming and uh, having a grand old time. But we saw real love appear out of that. I mean, I, I recall one of the VBSs, we were caring for some children whose mom was dying. And she, 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 she died of cancer a little bit later. And uh, I felt honored that we had that opportunity to, to be with those children in those moments. So real love. I know it's, it's such a thing to, to say love, you know, love this, love that, love, love, love. But sacrificial, real love is beautiful. And it is rare. And I'm so grateful for the people in this church family who I see really loving each other. Really. They, they, they talk outside of church. They, they, they hang out with each other. They pray with each other over the phone. They read the Bible together. It is beautiful. And I'm grateful for that. Six. The presence of God. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
And from Exodus 33, 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. All this is building on, on one step to the next. Raise your hand if you've ever felt the presence of God near you. Is there anything better than knowing that God is near and he loves you? Maybe it was during a prayer time. Maybe it was reading the scriptures. Maybe it was in a worship service. You felt in your heart his love for you. What more is there than the love of the creator of the universe? I began to learn to practice the presence of God and really sense God near me. You know, Brother Lawrence wrote in that classic book, Practicing the Presence of God, this guy was no, you know, professor of theology. He, he was a dishwasher at Austin. And he said, I, I've learned to always have an eye on God near me at all times. So he'd be washing those dishes and he would feel God's love right there with him the whole time. And we tried here at the Salvation Army to begin to pray over our buildings, pray over our homes, pray over each other. Pray together weekly during kettle seasons. And we begin to sense God's presence with us. One of my favorite memories, and you'll see the pictures, is from the National Day of Prayer event at Plant Square. I remember at that event, 12 pastors gathered. And we, we got together and we, we did something. And we dedicated the city of Owasso. And we put the city of Owasso into the hands of God. We dedicated it to God and just said, God, this city now is yours forever. And ever since then, whenever I drive past Lyon Square, I just feel something important happened that day. We put the city in the hands of God and said, God, this is your city forever. It's not some secular human place. It is a city that belongs to God Almighty. We felt it ever since that something important happened on that day. We've had many people come into this facility and simply say, I felt the Holy Spirit here when I walked in. I felt the Holy Spirit here when I walked in. Is there anything better to know that God is with us? That he's not left us, he's not forsaken us. Someone walks in here and says, I feel the Holy Spirit. Our church became a family. An odd family to, to boot, myself included. But a family nonetheless. <laughs> that's what the kingdom of God is. It's a motley crew of people from all different sorts of walks of life who have said, I want to know the God who made this planet. And I worry that in the body of Christ we've become so rigid, so doctrinal, that we've lost touch with the spiritual aspects of our faith. Deep prayer, spiritual gifts, healing, sensing God's presence, dreams and visions from the throne of God. Our faith is supernatural. And if you remove those supernatural elements, you get something that it was never meant to be. It is meant to be supernatural in nature. Seventh. And finally, God has been teaching us how to walk and live and step with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So all these things that God has taught us, all, all six culminate in the seventh. That if we, if we are humble, if we are walking in the fear of the Lord, if we do love each other, if we are walking in holiness, then all these things will culminate in the presence of God, 
then at last, courageously, then at last we will learn to walk in step with the Spirit. And I've seen many of the believers in this room begin to speak that way. I just knew that God was calling me to go minister to that person. God made it very clear in prayer I was supposed to join in on this ministry. God made it very clear that this was the next step in my spiritual journey, right? Walking in step with the Holy Spirit. And guess what that means? I'm no longer in charge of my life. I literally allow God by the Spirit to guide step by step what I do in life. I, I pray and I seek the scriptures, talk to friends, seek wise counsel, and then I discern this is where God's leading me. More and more it manifests into a lifestyle where God will nudge you to do something, to talk to someone, to minister to someone, to go pray, to go take a nap, to go eat something, you know, just simple things where God will say, here's the next step. And I've been learning to practically live my life by that leading of God, and I've seen that in our people here as well. It's walking in step with the Spirit, and it's being led by the Spirit. It's following the will of God for your life on a daily basis, and it's amazing. In the church, we begin to change how we thought here at the Salvation Army. We begin to, we in the past, we would say, I'd like to start this ministry, or we should do it this way. And, this, and later, we started to ask, what ministry is God calling us to start? How would God want it done? It feels like such a slight adjustment, but when we let God lead, he will guide us in the right direction. Friends, I got tired of bumping my head up against failure, because I was outside the world. Let's let God set the agenda and see what he wants us to do. And that has yielded fruit. That has yielded fruit. God has done great things. And, and listen, it's not about any person here. It's not about me. It's not about any of my church members. It's not about any of us here. It's about God and what he did. It is about God and what he did. He did great things. And we give him all the glory. So in conclusion, God has done great things at the Salvation Army, and he will continue to do great things in the future. Let's review our main points from today. Number one, courage. It all starts there. I'm willing to begin to pursue God courageously. Number two, the fear of the Lord. Trembling enough at God's word to humbly want to do what he says. Number three, humility. Humbling ourselves, not getting prideful, not making it about us, but making it about him. Holiness, beginning to see our lives change, sins fade away, sins disappear. Double-mindedness began to become a single-minded focus on God. Number five, sincere love for each other. Number six, practicing the presence of God. And number seven, being led by the Spirit. And that, friends, over the last five years is what God has taught me in a master's class of, of struggles and difficulties and frustration and giving up and not wanting to keep going and, and picking myself up again and refusing to give up, keeping going, staying in faith and seeing what God would do. We celebrate what God has done. We give him all the glory. And we are excited for what God is going to do in the future with our next leader, Major Tim Parker. We pray for the leaders who are coming to take over. Please pray for myself and Chelsea as we move to our next appointment. We love you all. And we know that the seeds God has planted will continue to grow and flourish as you continue to seek the Lord. I charge you to continue to walk purely before him, refusing to allow any open doors to sin in your life. I charge you to continue to spread the word in this community that Jesus is alive. And all may find salvation in him. God bless you, and may God bless the Salvation Army in Shiawassee.